Well, hey guys, welcome back to Sweetly Home. My name is Mandy. If you are new here, welcome. Um, we are going through the book The Life Giving Home by Sarah and Sally Clarkson, and we are going month by month because the book is broken down month by month and it gives practical tools as well as a whole lot of heart gripping stuff to work through as you prepare a life giving home for everyone who enters it. This book is not simply for moms and it's not simply for homemakers. If you have a home, if you have have an environment that you create space and life in, this book is for you. I was somebody, um, for four and a half years, we lived with my in-laws while we did a whole home gut and renovation, and all I had to create a life-giving space for my family was a bedroom and I didn't really have a space to decorate. We were given freedom to just, you know, make the space our own, and my mother-in-law is amazing. They are just like some of my best friends. Um, she generously shared her home with us. Um, but, so I had to craft a space for my family in an environment that really wasn't my home. And so I just want to encourage you that if you feel like, well, I'm not a mom or I'm not really, I don't classify myself as a homemaker, if you have a home environment, this book is for you. So there's lots of fun things and um, different um, heart attitudes that we can take and learn from, and there's really practical tips to make uh, a life-giving home for all who enter the doors, including yourself. So today we're going to go through some of the practical steps in um, the October chapter of creating uh, a home, life-giving home for your family. Um, I'm not going to go through all of them. In the spirit of wanting to make sure that I protect um, Sally's like copyrights and stuff like that, I don't want to give away all of her information that she put into her book. Um, we're just going to walk through a few ideas um, and then if you have the book of course you can kind of dive in a little bit deeper um, and we'll just go from there. So, so this chapter is all about service and the heading of each of the different um, sections is all about serving. So serving up beauty and connection friendships, welcome, sustenance, um, and so she kind of breaks down uh, those ideas to give you some more concrete and practical ideas for you. So I, um, one of the first ones was serving up sustenance, and I loved this idea um, of serving meals and food to people. Um, and I wanted to read this paragraph because it kind of really hit me. She says, When I ponder the amazing variety of what God has given human beings to eat, fruit, vegetables, spices, meats, fish, beans, nuts, cheese, drinks, sweets, textures, colors, and tastes, I have to deduce that the creator of the universe cares a great deal about sustaining us and giving us pleasure. The life artist who created humans with noses to smell, skin to feel, taste to savor, eyes to approve color and beauty, and minds to enjoy engaging with others intended to make himself known through all these senses and faculties. And, you know, I think sometimes we take a lot of that stuff for granted. Like, as she listed it out and, um, and you know, described all of the things that we do have to eat and um, our senses, I think we take a lot of those things for granted until it's taken away. Um, we don't really think that we can see and that we can taste and touch and that all of these things that God designed us to have, want and need and crave pleasure and good things and he provides us for that in the foods that we eat and the things, the cozy fabrics that our skin touches and the warm um, environments that we create and the smells and just all of that. Um, and so she goes on to talk a lot about um, about feasting and preparing like a beautiful table for her family um, and about how their dining room has often been the stage upon which our f family life was played out um, at least three times each day, not to mention tea time, snacks, coffee breaks, popcorn by the fire, pizza nights, midnight snacking, holiday gorging, whoever is home will gather to share food and share our lives. Our family has locked thousands and thousands of meals where we not only ate, but also talked, laughed, and rested together. So, I guess, um, one thing in our culture today that sometimes goes, 
is one of the first things to kind of go away is meal times as a family. And um, I know that even with our own self, sometimes it's just like the end of the day and I'm zonked and the kids want to watch a show on YouTube and I'm just like, okay, go ahead. And, you know, but really, like, there's... Um, life is to be served at the table and that's where kids learn like conversation skills and um, it was just such a reminder to me that in this very ordinary thing that has to happen every single day three times a day uh, providing meals and and eating meals um, that life can be given there and um, that was a challenge to me because in this season of busyness for us dinner is like we sit down as a family but um, we're often kind of absorbed and not connecting as we should and so that was a big challenge to me and she talks about that a bit more in the next um, in the next section which is serving up connection and she talks again a bit more about the idea of gathering at the table she said every night at our house candles are lit music is played and a full table is usually set even if the cuisine is a bowl of cereal and every night, whoever is home will sit around that table and connect. We linger over meals, talking about every possible subject. We discuss world issues, ask hard questions, challenge thoughts, share scriptures, relate the stories of the day. Making the family table a daily habit ensures that all of us keep up with one another's live lives, each other's lives. News, stories, victories, and disappointments. Dinner table discipleship is what we call it. And when our children lived at home, it happened every single night. Every child was expected to share opinions about articles they had read, scripture passages they were pondering, inspiring stories they had heard. No comment was rejected as silly because we wanted them to practice exercising their ideas and to learn and to reason in a group. Today, people often ask me how my children were accepted into schools like Yale, Cambridge, and Oxford. I honestly believe that to a great extent, it was due to those intentional moments of discipleship, wanting our kids to learn to think both clearly and biblically, and to be able to defend their ideas and their faith, hoping to inspire them to care deeply about truth. So one of the other things that I thought we could really kind of connect with here is serving up a welcome. So she talks about how she has a chalkboard at their um, front door, and that um, when friends or strangers um, come to visit, whether for a few hours or a few days, they find the word welcome written in chalk along with their names. How cute is that? I love, love, love that idea. And I think that's uh, something that I want to incorporate into our home. Um, we don't have a lot of people that come to visit us. We kind of live a bit further out from a lot of people. So when people make the trek out here, um, I really want to take advantage of welcoming them into our home. And I love the idea of, of a chalkboard. And I think that's something that uh, is really simple and that a lot of us could do. So if you don't already have a chalkboard on hand, it's very simple. Just get some chalkboard paint. You can get it at Michael's, just even in the um, craft paint section. And get a picture frame. And you can paint the glass of the picture frame. Or you can get some like unfinished wood. Um, really pretty much anything that you have laying around and just paint the surface of that item um, and then you want to let it dry and then you're going to season your chalkboard so you take your chalk and you rub it all across the chalkboard wipe the chalk dust all off so it's you know nice and clean and then it's seasoned and um, you can write your messages so um, a chalkboard to welcome people um, she talks about how when her children were young, they went to go visit a friend who was a single woman. Um, and she, the woman, kept um, a little decorated box that held a treasure trove of coloring books, stickers, stuffed animals, Legos, and small puzzles just waiting for a visiting child. And I love that idea of, um, you know, the single single woman who didn't have children but knew that children would come into her space and she kept things uh, to occupy them and care for them. A few weeks ago we went to randomly go visit uh, a couple that um, my husband had befriended. Um, they're an elderly couple. Um, they're kind of probably heading on into their late 70s um, and we just kind of showed up unannounced. They were out in their yard uh, doing some yard work and we happened to drive by and my husband and I hadn't seen them in years and um, they just they uh, they allowed our kids to kind of just go through all of their um, 
the things in their home. They have like a lot of antiques and very um, treasured sort of items, but they were so completely open and welcome uh, to allow my kids just kind of to play with their things. Um, and of course, Mama's Watchful Eye was always on them, but they were so easy going about it that it made me relax as a mom and to not feel like I had to um, keep my kids contained and sitting while we visited. Uh, and so to have that sort of attitude was just so awesome. And while she didn't have a lot of um, toys and things like that for young kids, she did have a couple of things and um, she brought them out for the kids and stuff. So I love that idea of just having things on hand for um, for all for ages of children who may be visiting your home and you don't have those ages. And then she talks about wanting to be ready for overnight guests. And again, we're, we don't have a lot of overnight guests, and when we do, we really like to try and make them feel welcome. But she commented um, how she would always have clean, uh, clean, fresh pair of sheets, a bowl of chocolate-covered almonds on the bedside table, and a couple of bottles of water. And, you know, that would just be in um, one of the kids' rooms that would serve as the guest room, and so that child would go bunk with another um, sibling. And she says now with the kids all out of the nest, it's a lot easier to have all of that stuff on hand, but to be, um, just to have sort of that arsenal. And there's a lot of really good videos here on YouTube about preparing for guests, and I love watching those, even though I really don't have guests coming over, but um, there, there's some really good ones out there. So uh, she talks, she says, have clean sheets, towels, and necessities waiting for when guests arrive. Fresh flowers, a candle with matches, and a hello card by the bed providing a welcoming touch. Provides a welcoming touch. So do bottles of water and some snacks. A lamp right, a lamp right by the bed is a big plus and makes reading in bed easier. Provide something to read if possible or point out where to find reading material. Keep a stock of toiletry items a guest might have forgotten. Fresh toothbrushes, travel sites, toothpaste, shampoos, and disposable razors, etc. Put out food in the kitchen, a bowl of grapes, some oranges or apples, some roasted and salted nuts. Be sure guests know where it is and that it is there for them to eat. Walk the guests through the house and explain the household schedule. And then she says this last item is especially important. Coming into someone else's home can make many people feel uncertain. Little gestures go a long way in providing a strong sense of comfort and belonging. As someone who travels a lot and stays in many homes, I love to be led and provided for and not left in suspense about my schedule or food and drinks. It gives me ease when someone has already thought through ways to make me feel comfortable in their, their home. We will leave at this time, and now you are free to rest for an hour. The bathroom and the towels are here. Fruit, crackers, and cheese are right here in the fridge. Here is a place where you make, make coffee or tea. If I can help you in any other way, please let me know. Having guests in the home is a great way to teach children how to serve others by welcoming them. Um, and then she talks about um, teaching her kids how to initiate conversation with guests. And... These are the things that I, as a mom, really need to know. Um, so I'm going to pass these um, along to you, and then um, we'll wrap up here in a minute. Uh, so she says, so some of these initiating conversations would be, so happy you can visit us, so nice to meet you. Um, have you had a good trip? Where did you just come from? Tell me a little about yourself. Where did you grow up? Of all the places you have visited, what is your favorite place? Tell me about your work or mission or family. Um... And so, yeah, that's just so good for me as a mom um, to know uh, how to teach my kids to do that sort of thing. Because one thing that I know that I'm weak on is my conversational skills. I love to meet new people. I love to, um, I'm a people person, even though I'm really kind of shy. Um, but sometimes I feel like my conversation skills can really lack. And so it's just these little things that really kind of... Um, are good for me to know. And then we're going to leave on this. Uh, she does have a few more things in the chapter, but she talks about serving up rest for you. A personal note for those who serve at home. When you're thinking of home as a place of refuge, respite, and rest, a place to serve those in need, please remember to include yourself. In my crowded household, I do get tired of people often. I learned not to feel guilty about it, but to see it as a sign of my own need to take a break. 
I regularly collect movies that I can watch, take hot baths with my favorite music playing, go out to a favorite cafe by myself or with a friend, or go shopping to buy one beautiful thing for me. And while I'm doing those things, I do not answer the phone or emails or texts. Burnout is always a possibility for those of us who are called to serve friends, family, and others longing for home. Take care to fill up your own soul so you can give back to others. You matter so very much. And that's so true. Um, you do matter. You matter so much. And you matter so much to the people in your world. And it's so important to take some time for you to fill yourself back up. If you aren't doing it, no one else will. And so I want to encourage you to take some time to really be honest with yourself and to think about the things that fill you back up. Make a list of them. Pull out a sheet of notebook paper, write it in your planner, what, pull up a, the note app on your phone, and write out things that fill you back up. So that when you are in a season where you are feeling burned out, you can consult that list and do some of those things. I think sometimes the tendency as women, we um, say, I don't have time for that. And you know what? I get that. Um, we've all got loaded plates. We're all way too loaded. But, but it is a priority for you to take care of yourself. It has to be. You are no good to anybody else if you don't take care of yourself. At least a bit. You have to do it. So... Anyways, I hope you guys enjoyed this chapter. Let me know some of your thoughts on it, and I will chat with you soon. 